uh, Holy to Morocco. Uh, just be before we begin, some uh, housekeeping uh, rules. Uh, each speaker will have 20 minutes to present the paper, and each presentation will be followed by 30 minutes. Since the schedule is very, very tight, I will have to be very strict uh, about time, and I will give you notes for five minutes ahead of your uh, end of presentation, and then uh, two minutes. And please let's try to keep uh, time. Um, okay, so our first uh, speaker is Professor Daniel Schrader. Uh, Professor Schrader is the Amos uh, Dana Memorial Chair in Jewish History at the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis. His books include The Sultan's Jew, Morocco and the Sephardi World, The Merchants of Savera, Urban Society and Imperialism in Southwestern Morocco, 1844-1886. Both books were translated to Arabic and published in Morocco. He is co-editor of Jewish Culture and Society in North Africa and an editor and contributor to Encyclopedia of the Jews in the Islamic World. He was the 2014-15 Ina Levin Scholar in Residence at the Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and is co-writing the book with Omar Boom on the monarchy and Muslim Jewish relations in colonial Morocco during World War II uh, in history and memory. Professor Schrader's paper is titled Representing the Sultan as Protector of Moroccan Jews during World War II. Please join me in the book. Thank you very much. Welcome, and I, I also want to thank uh, all the organizers. Uh, Samir, since you, I, I'm not going to remember all the names, but I also want to extend my gratitude. But since uh, I, I, I'll take the, my opportunity as first speaker to also thank you, Samir, for uh, um, you know, conceptualizing this prompt and bringing together all, all, all of us. Uh, uh, which, which I find tremendously gratifying to see that there are so many people working on you know, interesting and overlapping topics, which certainly wasn't the, the case uh, um, even just a few years ago. And, uh, and I think uh, you know this is this is such a great opportunity to uh, to ex exchange ideas on this uh, you know, very interesting and, and, and important. Uh, Topic as, as you uh, interestingly, I think, framed it in your your, your, your remarks. Um, what I, I'd like to sort of begin with uh, maybe a little historiography about uh, on, on the subject of uh, the Sultan Mohammed V and, and Jews, and, and it's really, as as many people here I know are are aware, a kind of debate about um, the question: Did uh, did Mohammed V uh, protect the Jews, or did or did he not? Was he able to? What what were the impediments in his ability to do anything? What what were his intentions? Um, and and so I'd like to you know in within that debate. Um, I should mention uh, the, the first scholar of the, you know, from the Hebrew University, Michel Abitbo, was really the first person to write uh, about um, uh, the history of Jews in North Africa during, uh, during the Second World War. Um, and he, in Michel's book, he doesn't really talk very much about the question of uh, the Sultan and what he did or didn't do. In fact, I think there's only a, a, a kind of footnote in his book where he he basically mentions that uh, that there's really no evidence at all that the, the that the Sultan did anything at all to protect uh, to protect the Jewish population or unable to do so, but but he doesn't he doesn't really pass any kind of moral judgment on, on the question. Um, and, but interestingly, it's it, I, I would think I think that, that that footnote on this question is probably cited and quoted more than anything else in that book. Um, now, to juxtapose Michel Abitbol with with another. Uh, 
you know, very diametrically opposed account. Uh, there's a, a book by Robert Asaraf on Mohammed V and, and, the, uh, um, and the Jews uh, dur during uh, Vichy. And then quite, you know, quite to the contrary, uh, Robert Asaraf writes almost a panegyric account about uh, Mohammed V as, as a philo-Semitic, anti-racist uh, protector of the Jews whose goal throughout the war was to basically to, uh, and, and during Vichy in particular, to to protect the Jews. And interestingly, uh, Michel Abitbo wrote the preface to uh, to his book. Uh, uh, Michel Abitbo was the shareholder of the uh, Robert Asaraf uh, you know, chair and, uh, and, so, and so forth. So what, what I want to kind of shift focus to, and I think what's, and what's interesting in this debate is really more, not so much what actually happened or what the Sultan did or didn't do, which I can, you know, we can certainly talk about that in the discussion, but rather what is at stake in this debate? What, is it, what does it mean? What does it signify? Um, and so in the project that uh, Omar and I are undertaking, we really are trying to ask a different set of questions. Um, the first is, you know, what is the significance of the myth of the Sultan's protection? And I should say when I when I use the term myth in a more public, um, academic uh, uh, setting, uh, I, I, I've gotten quite a bit of a, uh, flack, negative reaction, um, because of because because this myth, as 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 it certainly is, um, uh, you know, ra raises a, challenges a lot of conceptions, um, and so that leads me perhaps to the other the, the other question: um, Why such a veneration of the dynasty by Moroccan Jews, and especially symbolized by? Uh, the Sultan's action and protection of the Jews in the Second World War. Um, thirdly, wh why has it become this issue of the Shoah or the the Sultan and his uh, you know, Mohammed V's actions in the war, during the Second World War? Why has it become such a fundamentally important um, aspect of official discourse in Morocco itself? So, you know, such that um, it, 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 if it's if it's in any way questioned, it it, it raises a lot of uh, concern and uh, um, and it raises a lot of eyebrows. To be sure. Uh, so, in in this presentation today, um, what I would like to focus on especially is how this. This, the symbolism and, and the myth about the Sultan actually developed during World War II itself. Um, you know, from the many, many of those who sort of question it think, think in terms of its own, purely in terms of its later development. Of course, the meaning and discourse about it changes, and this is something that Omar will be addressing more in the recent and present and how discourses on, on, on the Second World War have been uh, adapted and what, what, it, what does it signify. Um, but during the, during the war itself, the myth developed and, some, and immediately afterwards. In the years leading up to independence, it became uh, very important, obviously for somewhat different reasons than the discourse today. Um, and But during the Second World War, there were all kinds of Different players, um, you could say, different different actors um, who had quite a bit at stake at thinking about the Sultan as um, as protector, including, of course, the monarchy itself, but also the French, the French protectorate authorities, the settler community, uh, the Spanish, the Spanish government, um, the nationalists. Uh, and, and of course, the Jewish community itself. Okay, so, so I'll, I'll begin with a few remarks about the monarchy. Um, 
and, and my central contention here is that representing the Sultan as protector of Jews during the war was very important in terms of legitimizing the monarchy in the Alawite dynasty itself and for its um, continuation, for, it, for its assertion to, to a certain extent uh, and, and in a sense for the first time of independence from the residency, the French residency, referring to the, 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 the French central French protectorate uh, authorities, um, who, of course, during the war and during Vichy were responsible for implementing the uh, anti-Jewish uh, Jewish laws. Um, it was a means by which the Sultan could take lead uh, of, of, uh, as leader of the nation, as sort of an emerging uh, national identity, but also to outmaneuver uh, the, the nationalists who um, who were also had emerged as um, uh, increasing in importance in the 1930s, but then who had been somewhat eclipsed after their suppression by the French protectorate authorities in 1936 and 1937. Uh, so it marks, in a way, uh, the issue, the Jewish issue, becomes very important during the war uh, as the, the, the still young Sultan is trying to shift from being merely a kind of figurehead used by the French authorities for their own purposes to more of a leader and eventually more powerful leader. Uh, and here, I think, lies a, I think one of the really interesting paradoxes of the situation. Um, what the Sultan was able to achieve um, was, uh, and, and especially, you know, with, with, uh, with independence in the years leading up to uh, independence and then after, uh, after independence in Morocco, was essentially to monopolize the power that was based on this, the very structures of colonialism. So, you know, it takes the uh, what might what, what has been described as the neo machsan the, the, the sort of the recreated or reinvented uh, uh, indigenous government that was that was recreated by the French, or he or, and the military, which was essentially uh, which, which was essentially created by the French, but consisted of mainly Moroccan uh, soldiers who fought uh, the, basically the colonial war uh, for the French, uh, and the dynasty itself. Uh, and, um, and, and essentially, this was the structure that ensured the continuity of the dynasty in Morocco, independent, post-independence um, uh, Morocco. So, um, so during, during the war and before the war, essentially uh, the, the Sultan's survival and uh, continuity was very much based on his complicity with, clon with the colonial power, yet at the same time uh, it, it became important to, to you know, this represent representation of protecting the Jews and his opposition to the anti-Jewish laws during uh, Vichy as a way to assert himself as a national leader and and eventually what could be then read into it is is it was a kind of anti anti-colonial action on the part of the, the Sultan and especially what was important here is it came at a time when the uh, many of the nationalists who many of whom were in exile, or some of them had moved to the northern zone uh, under the Spanish, uh, were, were discrediting the Sultan for, for his inability uh, or refusal to defend them when they were being suppressed. And so there was a kind of uh, gap that developed between them in, in, this, in this period. Uh, and, um, and in a sense, uh, the Sultan was able to use use this to his advantage to gain, in a sense, to gain an upper hand uh, over them, and then eventually later to co-opt them as, as he emerges as the uh, national leader. And so what I'm saying is the, the, 
the Jewish question then becomes very important as a, as a way to maneuver in this manner during, during the war. Okay, so turning, and I'm, I'm, I may lose track of the time, so if you can, if, if, if you can remind me, uh, uh, you know, sooner than five minutes, so I don't, I don't want to go over. Okay, so um, turning now to the res residency of the French protectorate authorities, um, the, the resident general, Charles Nogues, um, it, it often interpreted as a kind of a complicated, enigmatic figure, as, as Susan pointed out in her, her remarks that she uh, distributed, um, was, was very much a part of the Vichy system. And, and in effect, uh, whatever his views may have been, he was obligated to implement the, the laws of, 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 of Vichy. Um, but he was also under a lot of pressure, both from sort of Vichy Central, from Algiers, um, from the, vet, the veterans organizations, the Légion de Française des Combattants, or their, their uh, uh, service d'ordre légionnaire, sort of the, the spearhead of the national revolution. What's that? Five minutes. I have five minutes left. Oh, goodness. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, so. Um, so I think what, what's important here, I, I think, to point out also is that, of course, we talk about Vichy, you know, Vichy in North Africa or Vichy, uh, but in many ways, you could say that the, 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 French, um, the French protectorate um, and its colonial structures in many respects remained intact um, before, during the war, and after the war. And in, and in many ways, even its policy towards the Jews, the various uh, dahirs, the decrees, and so forth, um, remained even through the Vichy period, even with the anti-Jewish laws that were being implemented. So in some ways, it was kind of business as usual, even during the war. Um, and, and you can see that certainly in the, the archives. But the central, the central issue for, um, for no guess in the, the, the residency was, was his devotion to French empire more than anything else. And, and the strength, uh, as he saw, of the empire depended on preventing um, or preserving the racial hierarchies that existed within the colonial system. And this included maintaining the indigenous status of the Jews, and maintaining some of their traditional economic roles and so forth. And so Nogus, and in many ways the protectorate authorities in Morocco did, didn't really see uh, the, the French protectorate as, a, as an extension of the national revolution, but rather they were trying to figure out ways of preserving, uh, preserving em empire. And in many ways, um, in many ways, you could say the anti-Jewish laws clash with these objectives of empire. And so, of course, here's where the irony, in a certain, to a certain extent, um, lies. They, um, they saw, you know, it wasn't so much they objected, that is, the, the protectorate authorities, or no guests objected to uh, the laws of exclusion with regard to Jews. It was, but it was in certain areas where they found um, the exclusion of Jews damaging to the economy, and the the very idea that Jews should be, you know, sort of a an entity a se an entity like uh, separate from the indigenous structure, also was challenging. And in that sense, there's a kind of convergence between the goals of the so well, the goals are very different, but there's a convergence of interests to represent the Sultan as, um, as protector of the Jews, both, both of whom uh, saw in many respects the anti-Jewish laws as work, working against their interests. And, and they're both sort of attempting, you could say, the monarchy on the one hand, protecting the others to, to manipulate the situation to, to their advantage, and in some ways, and, and eventually you could say that the monarchy really gained the upper hand in that, uh, in that equation. Um, 
I realize I have two other ingredients, um, uh, two other players that I wanted to talk about, but I, I may, I, but, but, well, I'll be very brief and then might come up uh, in, in discussion. Um, the other, I think, very important and much neglected issue in this whole um, um, dynamic that was going on with the Spanish in, northern, in the northern zone, Spain being a, a neutral power uh, d during the war, um, but the Jewish question for them also was of, of, of great importance because it was also uh, for them an important uh, aspect of their colonial rule and so that um, uh, dur during during the war especially during the Second World War uh, as you know the French were in, in a sense the arch competitors for the Spanish over the question of empire and so you, you have then during the war the situation of the Francoist Spain and the, the authorities in the north presenting themselves as protectors of the Jews as a way to undermine uh, French interest. And even, and, and this is, I think, of particular interest in light of the fact that just uh, weeks ago, Spain has been offering uh, uh, Sephardic Jews uh, nationality. Uh, of course, it's not the first time. It, 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 the first time was the 1920s. Um, I think then it was maybe more similar to, to Days, reasons, but during the war it became a, uh, it was very much uh, an instrument of you know, offering uh, uh, naturalization to Jews, especially in French Morocco, as a, as a means to um, uh, bolster their own position and un undermine the French. And, and they stood then in opposition to the anti Jewish laws and, and so forth. Um, and, and then finally, uh, and finally, of course, this, this, this discourse about the sultan as protector of, um, um, of the Jews became very important even during, during the war for Moroccan Jews themselves, uh, who were also trying to imagine, situate themselves uh, uh, in, in terms of Morocco and what their future uh, uh, may, may lie. And they, um, and so they, they themselves begin, began in a sense, and the leaders of the Moroccan Jewish community began, uh, in a sense, cultivating the myth of the sovereign and also playing um, into the, the the very idea of the uh, you know much pronounced uh, uh, phrase and often, often cited even during the war itself that uh, of the of the. Uh, of the Moroccan Sultan, uh, ensuring that there would be no difference between, uh, you know, Moroccan subjects, Muslims or Jews. They're all, you know, they're all his subjects, and so this becomes important as well for the Jewish community, and and that, in a sense, is, has its sort of uh, continuity up in, up until up until today, up uh, you know, until uh, until the present. I think that, that, that Omar will kind of pick up on some of those ideas in his, in his presentation. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. And, uh, Thank you very much. Uh, the floor is open for discussion. Daniel, um, your, uh, your argument is convincing and uh, certainly a uh, uh, a way to begin to rethink this whole question and the myth of the Sultan. There's one point that, um, uh, in which I, um, I'm not sure I completely agree. Okay. Um, which is the notion of the Sultan as an independent actor in the early 40s. Uh, I, I, uh, I question uh, his ability to act in a way that was uh, independent of the residency. Uh, uh, in 1940, 1941, 1942. Uh, we, we have to remember that his speech in Tangier was in 1947, and that's when he first emerged as a as a spokesperson for an alternative to the French. Uh, uh, seven years later, uh, David, perhaps you can comment more on this. Uh, 
in terms of its relationship with this to cloud. But it seems to me that you may have the seeds of a solution to this problem um, in, um, in that you might conflate uh, one and two. Um, in the sense that uh, it's hard for me to imagine the Sultan acting without having at least the blessings of Nogis. And it's, Nogis was a very, very subtle um, thinker. And it's very possible that Nogis was playing uh, uh, two cards at once. Um, that he was actually, and you suggest this, it seems yeah. to me this is implicit in your comments, yeah. um, that he was encouraging the Sultan uh, to adopt this this role of protector as as a way of uh, balancing um, the, the race laws that he signed off on. Yeah. Uh, it, we we don't have to see consistency yeah. in Nogues's personality. I don't think that's yeah. a fruitful um, route to go to understand this yeah. period. Yeah. But rather to see him as a very subtle behind the scenes actor pulling many different strings. So uh, in sum, I would say that. Um, you might consider um, seeing the Sultan as acting with the encouragement um, of Nogis in, in whatever respect he did encourage you, met with them, uh, met with communal leaders, that, that he had the blessings of the residency to do that um, uh, uh, in a way uh, that allowed the residency to play two different cards um, at once. No, I, I, you're, you're absolutely correct, and, and I in sort of in the shortness of time, I, I think in my written comments, I, I think I tried to convey that idea. Actually, I, and you're absolutely right. I mean, there, I wasn't. I think my point wasn't so much that uh, that that there were no limitations in his abilities to 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 act. That there certainly were, and um, and and of course he was well aware of this and he could have you know he could at any at any time have been deposed at the same time but he was also i think that where he begins to strike the greater um, um, sort of venture towards greater independence you know anticipating of course what was later to come in the 40s and his speech tangier and so forth um the point here is he, he began to do this during Especially during the war years, and so that the 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 Jewish issue became very important. The the other part of my argument, though, is exactly what you're you're saying that in in a way he did this with um, Nogus's blessings because Nogus himself had an interest in not really seeing the um, you know the the. Um, you know the full extent of these laws implemented because it was against his interest too. So, but so he needed, in a sense, the symbolism of the monarchy was very important for him, and so that gave, at least you could say, the Sultan some some leverage. Put it that way during 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 the war, probably because he was very well aware of um, that that there was a certain dependency of. No guess in his interest and his colonial interest in in the symbolism of the of, of the sultan, and you could say in some ways, um, you know, there's there's sort of a game, a uh, maneuvering game going going on where, you know, the where where, where Nogus really needed this image of the sultan as protecting all his subjects because it was important for legitimizing the you know the colonial venture as a whole vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, what was disrupting those aims, which was, in a sense, of Vichy, you know, anti-Jewish laws and the settler community and so forth. Um, and in that sense, and, and, and some of the commentators actually at the time uh, were, were talking about how the Sultan was actually sort of starting to gain a kind of upper hand over the, over the residency because of this, because it, it actually put Nogus in a kind of weak position, um, you, know, it, you know, in this sort of constellation of actors. So, yeah, I think you're, you're, you're absolutely right, right about that. Um, that that, no, that he, couldn't, he couldn't have done what he did or present himself as protector if it were not also in the interest of the residency itself. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs>
Um, so thank you for this presentation. I really love the subject. I'm looking forward to hearing Omar's paper as a continuity. So I have a question that maybe anticipates that comparison a little bit, um, which is the origin of this notion of co-opting the Jewish question, so to speak, by the Mahzen as a way of positioning itself on the international stage during this very formative period of the Second World War, right? It's not only in this period that we have Nogues, but we also have Mohammed V intersecting with a variety of philanthropic and international actors, notably the Americans, right? So, and it, it brings to mind something I saw in the Central Zionist archives once about Hassan Thani many years later, where there was some report saying he was sick of being called King of the Jews, and that any yeah. gratitude that he received, he would like to keep really down. Yeah. Um, and I'm thinking of that comment in juxtaposition of Muhammad V and this evolution of the myth of the king as protector of the Jews working in that favor. So I'm wondering if you can comment a little bit about that tension, both with the nationalist, the position of the monarchy on an international stage and in this colonial context that's really rapidly evolving. That, that's that's a really that's a that's a huge question, of course. Um, yeah. Let me, I'll, I'll give one example, which I think is interesting, you know, but I think it reflects sort of how things develop and evolve. Um, you know, short shortly, you know, after after independence, uh, Moroccan independence, you know, the, the uh, Mohammed V uh, banned emigration, basically emigration to Israel. And of course, it created a lot of uh, tension in the international community and pressures from various organizations and 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 and, and, and so forth. So the sort of the 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 response and discourse about it, which which became important as a way of legitimizing um, legitimizing the action uh, taken, was. Mohammed V's role in protection of the Jews during the Second World War. So, in other words, Morocco is a is a, is a country that offers um, uh, a place and protection of its its Jewish community. Um, you know, the subtext is um, there's no reason for them to go to Israel. You know, so. Um, so that's, I think, an example of how it, it evolves, but it also reflects the tensions uh, over this issue, I think, with, with the various outside uh, actors and pressures and international Jewish organizations and you know, the American government. And, and there's a sort of evolution at the same time, of, but a continuity of this, of, the, of this issue at the same time. But uh, Omar might have some... <laughs> he's, 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 he's still re recovering from his circuitous route uh, to to Jerusalem and jet lag. So I, I don't want to force this. No, I, I think that's true because if you look at the, the, actually in 1955, uh, there is this letter that Bernard Lecat writes to, which is very interesting, one of the founders of this university, uh, Einstein, who was actually part of the Liga talking about how, where Muhammad V and leaders of the Jewish community would fit in this in this discourse about Jews not only in the Middle East, the general Middle East, or the greater Middle East, or the both, but also whether they would be, would, whether they would be part of the, 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 the Israeli society in its early formative stages. So, so it's really interesting to see this, this and then Bernard Lukash ended up meeting the king right after independence. In not only in Rabat but also he met him later on in Paris. So, so you have also members of the Jewish community, not only a part of the World Jewish Congress, but also even leaders of the French Jewish community was also interested in pushing this narrative of Muhammad the Fifth as this um, good king that he saved Jews and he's good to the Jews, to the Jews of Morocco. Versus, because there is already a discourse about the Jews of Egypt, the Jews of Libya, and, and the Jews of Iraq. So that's the thing is those those narrative. Uh, so it, I think it's it's interesting, and, and then and then it became a key question for 
Hassan II, Hassan II, nobody could, if you look actually the newspapers from 1950s, early 1960s, all the way to the late 1980s, the Jewish question was the dossier, you know, just like Western Sahara, just like Islam. And then he changes, as, as uh, Susan did in her book, if you look at the newspapers in Morocco, really, and journalists in Morocco, that's one of the questions I think the center of the list, really shifted the debate about this question by the late 1990s in Morocco, both French newspapers as well as Arabic newspapers, which you don't see uh, in, in, in those years of the 60s and 70s because the king, you have to get the blessing of the king and the government to write about Jews, otherwise it would be a big trouble, just like if you write about Western Sahara. Uh, I, I just have a question. Yeah. Uh, uh, I would like to ask if it is helpful to compare the debate regarding um, the Sultan's protection of uh, his Jewish uh, subjects to other cases in which um, um, sovereigns were involved in during uh, the Shoah, and um, which um, and I refer here especially to the King of Denmark and uh, the King of uh, Bulgaria. And uh, my question is, um, should we uh, focus on um, the regime itself? Um, is it by chance, is it by accident that in these three cases, Mohammed, uh, the king of Denmark, the king of Bulgaria, we have three um, sovereigns. Do they have a personal... Um, is this a question also of loyal, loyalty, not just of the Jewish citizens, the Jewish subjects to the monarch, but also the loyalty of the monarch to his uh, Jewish subjects? So would you see here a common um, dynamics between these three sovereigns? Yeah, I, I, no, that's, a, that's a really interesting question. Um, and I have to say, I might not know enough about the the dynamics in Denmark or Bulgaria, but I, I, there's another maybe comparison I'd like to draw here. Um, in the case of Morocco, uh, I think what what might be distinctive or different is the position of of, of the king as um, uh, you know, as positioning himself as Islamic ruler, mm -hmm. and so that that Jews were subjects in you know, at least in, in a traditional sense, they were, um, it was it was a kind of duty, you might say, of the Islamic ruler to, to offer the protection to to the, to non-Muslim you know, subjects, and, and actually the, the Jews themselves sort of play on that during, during the war, that they were, you know, without using the term dimmi, that they were these protected subjects. Um, but I think where there's a, I, I think I can draw a few parallels about the, the use of the symbolism of the sovereign, not so much in a, a royalty, but if you take the case of Spain, for mm -hmm. instance, and, and the well-known myth about Franco's protection of you know the Jews, or you know at, this, at the same time that he's denouncing, of course, uh, uh, international jewelry and. Uh, and so forth, but it was it became um, during the war, um, you know, in the colonial context, more than the mainland important. And then, as the war comes to an end, it becomes important in, in positioning, um, you know, itself, you know, him, himself and uh, in, in the international community as a, you know, as a as a fascist who uh, who was uh, as. as as, um, um, as some of Patrick's research has shown so well in his, his recent research he's been doing um, you know, uh, um, on, on the Gestapo and their sort of collaboration with the Spanish and you know, the, the support of um, the fascism uh, and, and the Nazis and Mussolini and, 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 and so forth, bringing, bringing in hours of sort of anti-Semitic discourse. So there, there it becomes, you know, the, the symbolism and position himself vis-a-vis various countries, and even successfully, you 
would say, with Jewish organizations presenting himself as having uh, uh, protected um, Jews during the war. There's a certain parallel also, um, I think, with Turkey as well. There's a kind of similar situation of um, you know, sort of this, again, now you have a, uh, um, a kind of a autocracy, I would call, rather, maybe, you know, rather than the focus on the a sovereign, like a king or something, I think, uh, in sort of autocratic countries. Um, there's also a parallel there, playing, playing on the, the, the myth of uh, protection of the Jews. Um, uh, and, and in fact, of course, the historical record is much more complicated than that. So uh, I'm, I'm not sure if that quite gets at your question. I think I will ask also the same question to uh, Omar Boom. <laughs> yes, uh, we have actually three more uh, questions and uh, four minutes. <laughs> uh, so, um, so I await is the next, and then Sophie and uh, David Stenner. And I think we may. So that's just um, but I want to ask more about the cultural aspect mm -hmm. of this mm -hmm. and, and that um, has to do maybe with the way Jews and the Mahzan and the, the Sultan mm -hmm. and the French mm -hmm. narrated or, or, or how they narrated themselves mm -hmm. and how the war was the epitomize of, of, of a long um, discourse um, concerning the calamities of modernism with love. So mm -hmm. the war entered this whole discourse of, of how colonial modernity that the French world changed the old world. And then the Jews is part of the old order. And, and, and the Sultan as protector is something about restoring this order. So there's some similarities between all this kind of discourse and the Jews that want to, to be sure or, or to, to um, assert their place in the society, the Catholic society, the friends that want to preserve their, yeah. their, their um, colonial order and, and the Sultan that is also talking from this old order versus nationalism versus the French. And so in, in I think that the, the um, aspects of how people narrated their stories about the war and the Sultan within the story is interesting. I, I think you, you articulated it so well. I, I like this idea of the calamities of modernity. I mean, but yes, indeed. I mean, they're sort of negotiating the future with the sort of embedded older relationships of the past, whether it were, were the more of the traditional concepts of uh, you know, the relationship between Jews and Sultan Mahsan, or, or, the, or the colonial effort to recreate you know, the old order and so forth, to preserve the old order, going back to the you know, sort of Leote, sort of, you know, kind of reinvents tradition. So no, ab absolutely. I, I think it's, I, yeah. Thank you actually for bringing that up because I think it's, it's something that should really be, um, you know, brought up and elaborated on um, more in this in this in this narrative. And yeah. No. Ab absolutely. It's very much a part of the, I think, this larger picture. And I could say more, but I know yeah, the time is ticking here. For, uh, two more questions from Sophie and, uh, and David. Okay, I'll try to keep mine very short. <laughs> but one of the threads that I've been thinking about in reading all of our papers and thinking about our commonalities and also thinking about you know North Africa within the Holocaust as a broader idea is this issue of how we define Jews. And you mentioned that, the, the racial versus the religious definitions. And I'm wondering how, if at all, this plays out into these kind of political imaginations that are going on the Sultan as protector fighting against the French influence, but also it seems to be corresponding in that sense of definition. So it just, you can also pass and say we'll talk about this more as we keep discussing, but this, this you know, how we define yeah. Jews is a really interesting question. Yeah. 
Yeah. I, I, I saw. It's not short, actually. <laughs> I know. I, I, I saw Omar kind of, you know, nodding. So, I, so, so do you have do you have a, a, a more condensed way? Of, no, it's a very inter it's an important question. It's a great question. It's a great question. Of course, just uh, just as a as a. I mean, I'll just give a little historical note uh, to this. When when they were deliberating uh, over the you know the first statue uh, des week in 1940, and Vichy Central, they very much wanted you know the definition, the racial definition of Jews, and it it, it made no sense in a colonial context because for them the you know the sort of the the hierarchies were not racial per se, but they were more in terms of one's religious definition. And so as a consequence that at least in the first in the first statute mm -hmm. as it was applied both in Tunisia and Morocco, uh, they retained for the indigenous Jews as opposed to foreign Jews the the um, the racial um, I mean the, the religious definition. You know, the, Daniel and I were talking about this quite a bit during, you know, in, in reference to Tunisia, too, because you know, it had a kind of similar system. So um, maybe that's just a thought, maybe to invite then in our ongoing discussion during the workshop. Can I ask a question? Yeah, so the, the one thing I was thinking about is how to read. I mean, it's already there, but how to even more directly relate the story mm. to the overall theme, right? So how mm. did North Africans experience, how did they still think, how did they think about the Second World War, about the Holocaust? And, you know, for those of us who work in American history, right, that, you know, what, what is written on, on the Second World War can probably be, you know, printed on this tiny booklet. Mm. You know, it's like, arrival, like, war, uh, Sultan of the Jews, uh, Roosevelt arrives, mm. promises independence, yeah. that's basically it. Yeah. And so I wonder whether this um, uh, this myth, as you so well call it, of the Jews rescuing Sultan maybe further contributes to that by, 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 saying, by saying, look, our sovereign said, you know, he protected the Jews. So I mean, this, the Holocaust is already pretty foreign, right? Because it happened in Europe mm. to the largest extent, and it's a by and large for Moroccans, European event. But by saying, look, in our case, the Moroccan Sultan, even, you know, he protected the Jews, so, you know, what does it really concern us? And so that for an everyday experience of the you know, everyday Moroccan, who's, you know, just reading this part of the story, it might make the Holocaust even, even less comprehensible. And so I'm just, so I don't know if you have to, like, extrapolate on that for, like, 10 minutes, because I think everybody wants a break, but I just want to <laughs> throw it out. Well, I mean, there's a big element of sort of staging the Holocaust involved here. But if you look, I mean, if you actually look at, like, let's say the, the vast majority of the population, Muslim population, the, the the question of Jews was not not really very important at all. You know, I, and I think in this, in some ways you show that in your you know your intervention. It just wasn't very, very important. I mean, there's a, you know, in the history of historiography, there's a, there's a, there's a tendency to try to, you know, to, to, to link, uh, you know, link Nazis and, and, and Arabs. You know, I mean, there's, there's a whole context for that. Um, but if you actually look at, you know, as, as you have, uh, you, you read the writings of nationalists and, and stuff. The question. Jews or the, the Holocaust is is not really very important to them. Of course, it is for it is for Jews, but for very different you know for different reasons. And I think that that's that's something important that we shouldn't lose sight of as well, because you know we we're, we're focusing this you know we're focusing on this on this question. Of course, we're trying, drawing up an archive. You know, what we can on uh, on this, um, you know, and, and there's a lot of writing and you know ar archives about it and so forth. But um, but overall, it, how you know it wasn't really all that important for the for the population as a whole. 
know, and uh, and there's still and that gap, you know, in a sense, still exists. You know, and, and Omar can, can, can address that um, better for the contemporaries. So I, I don't know if that sort of gets at what you're. <laughs> but I, I don't want to. I don't want to, to monopolize our uh, our great time. And, uh, Thank you very much. Outside. Outside. Yeah, here's coffee.